Hey everybody and welcome into the sanctuary. How are you all doing? Did you have a good time on Friday night? All right, I don't know about you, but my feet are still sore from all that dancing. It was just tremendous and wonderful and I thank everybody who was there and everybody who had anything to do with the possibility of it coming into being. And there'll be more gratitude later. But for today, we have to look at what we are doing here in the sanctuary on Sunday mornings. As we move through this month of October, we are moving more deeply into the awareness that all we're here to express and to experience is that deep, beautiful, loving relationship we have with Source, and that your life and my life is nothing but a love story. And so divine intimacy is the topic for today, and um, it is something that we are asked this week to pay attention to and to give our you know, all to allowing ourselves the beauty and the grace of experiencing that intimacy with the divine. And this is not something that we do locked away in a little corner in a beautiful little state with our little bowls and bells and shawls and all the rest of it only, although I have to say I like all of that stuff too. But this is something that is just so full and embodied in every aspect of our life and living that today we have an opportunity to embrace it more and more so that it can be every breath we breathe and every thought we think and every word we speak and everything we do, that it can show up in all of that and exactly who and what we are. So divine in intimacy, if you look at the word intimacy, it conjures up all kinds of things in different people's minds. I went to the dictionary for the fun of it last night and it gave eight definitions of uh, intimacy and it was on the lines of warm, familiar, comfortable, and so on and so forth with any person, place, or thing. And uh, the, the, the eighth definition was sexual activity. Now, the sexual activity thing arose around the 1600s, according to the dictionary, and um, I'm not sure where all your minds went when you heard intimacy, I know where mine went. So we're not talking about anything other than the beautiful sensual, because we're all sensual individuals, and that's a beautiful, gorgeous thing to be, the beautiful, sensual, divine, intimate relationship we can have with Source, which is life, and we're all in it. Remember, one life, God life, whole life, perfect life, and that life is my life now, and your life now. The one life, that's all. One, 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 one. There is never a two when we're talking about the divine. It's always one. So divine intimacy, how do we establish that, especially in a world that at the moment seems to be sinking, flooded, on fire, absolutely caught up in the throes of war and rumors of war, mass murdering going on, especially at our own, uh, in our own land and at our own doorstep. Um, the endless stories of all kinds of that which is terrible and awful and so on and so forth. It's the same as ever it was, the worst of times and the best of times. And what we do with all of that, I can tell you this much, if you and I are not intimate in our relationship with Source, we're not going to be able to do much of anything. And we are going to live in fear and we are going to continue awfulizing and terribleizing and know what it is to experience separation disconnection, and worry, worry, worry. And that's not who we are, and that's not why we're here this Sunday morning. And so how do we find in the midst of all of that, the way through all of that, that raises and expands and lifts life and creates the confluence for healing and unification to occur? 
We have to take care of business, my dear ones. We're here on a Sunday to take care of our spiritual business. That's why we're here. Anytime we come into this room, anytime we come into our classrooms, anytime we gather together, we're here to take care of our spiritual business. And in so doing, create this wonderful energy in the world that helps the world to align and become the world of serenity that it was meant to be. Yes, in spite of it all, whatever it is that's going on out there, this is your purpose, it's my purpose at the moment, and the purpose is always changing. So, intimacy. Since time began, we've had the crying, and we've had the longing, and we've had the yearning, and we've had the hearts aching for this divine intimacy. It goes way back in time. If you go to the psalmists, and I like to go to the psalmists, every now and again I visit them, they were my companions for a long time. And you'll hear them crying out. Now these are the saints and the sages, and these are the ones who are totally committed to their spiritual life unfolding, and they're crying out, oh God, you are my God, for you I long, for you my soul is thirsting, my body pines for you like a dry, weary land without water, like the deer that yearns for living springs, so is my soul yearning for you, my God, oh God, my God, etc., etc., etc. Now you're saying to yourself, and they also, cry out and say, every night I flood my bed with weeping and I drench my couch with tears. Oh God, where are you? When did you last drench your couch with tears, longing for intimacy with God? When did those tears pour down your eyes as you felt that darkness of separation? And when did the tears pour down your eyes when you felt the intimacy and the union and communion with your source. And if you're not drenching, something is not happening. And so today we want to get on the inside of what those people were going on about. I think that St. Augustine sums it up very nicely when he says, you have made us for yourself, O Lord, and our hearts cannot find rest until they rest in thee. And there's no, there's going to be no satisfaction for you and for me, none whatsoever, ever, 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 until you and I are aligned with the source of our being, until you and I can enjoy the sense of, I am accompanied, I am held by a love that will not let me go. I am being courted every moment of my existence by the creator of my being, the sustainer of my life, and the lover of my soul. But my job is to court back, and that's where the gap comes in. I don't court back. I don't give the relationship the honor and the respect and the love that it requires for it to be sustained and maintained. As I was saying this morning, if you bumped into somebody who was your, what they call soulmates, although I have to say, there's no such thing as one soulmate in my opinion. We're all soulmates to each other, but that's talk for another time. Anyway, you meet this person, this, and you look at each other, you find each other's eyes, and you know this is the one. Absolutely, this is the one. I know this is the one. I am going to marry this one, and we're going to live happily ever after for the rest of our lives. And that's just how it is. I just know it's going to be so. And then you meet and greet each other, and you just, it's like, da, 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 da. And you hug, and then there's this thing, fairyland thing, you know, and the Disney thing, and so on and so forth. The princess kissed you, and the princess is kissed back, or the princess and the princesses, or whatever else we're doing with ourselves these days in order to express our love for each other. But after that, you go your separate ways, and that's it. You never call each other, you never text each other, you never email each other, you never call each other up for, for, for a cup of coffee or whatever. That's it. Well, I tell you, that's not going to last any longer than the few seconds or minutes you came together. It's the same with the divine. Until you and I understand that I have to give my time, effort, and energy to the greatest of all love affairs, my relationship, my love affair with life, with spirit. My life cannot ever reach any sense of wholeness, completeness, and satisfaction. Ain't got no satisfaction <laughs> in any day that I haven't 
being in contact, conscious contact with my source. You can call that spiritual practice or whatever you want to call it, but it's more than a practice. It's a feeling, it's an energy, it's an essence that you cannot, you cannot ignore or avoid. No matter what's going on in your life, whether you have one wheel on your wagon or five, the four and the spare, it doesn't matter. You can feel that way. You can sense that moreness that we talk about. You can sense how indeed we are totally absorbed in this thing called the breath of life, life itself, the essence, the divine, that which is real. And in our spiritual practice, we are open to being taken out of the illusion into that which is real. The thing is how many of us are hungering and thirsting and longing for this experience. The way we hunger and thirst for power, or hunger and thirst for money, or hunger and thirst for, for, for my ideal companion, or hunger and thirst for whatever heck we're, we're hungering and thirsting for that we think we're going to get from out there, the material outside world. It cannot be. It cannot happen. It's not going to happen. See, everything the outside world takes care of itself when I have taken care of my interior state of being. Seek ye first the kingdom and its right consciousness, and all things else will be added unto you. For my desire is that you should have life and have it in abundance and that your joy may be complete and that the peace that passes understanding is that which you can absolutely enjoy and sustain. For I am with you as I always have been and I shall always be with you. And it doesn't matter. There are no floods that can drown this love. There are no fires that can burn up this love. Though thousands be at my right and thousands be at my left and come at me, nothing of you will be harmed or touched because I am with you. And if you know it, and if you feel it, and if you allow it, and if you say yes to it, then you are unstoppable, unconquerable, and you will stand. And you will stand in the truth and you will be the truth, and you'll be the light, and you'll be the life, and you'll be the beacon of grace wherever you are. Because right where I am, God is. And where God is, always, all is well. So what is your hunger and thirst like? I love the story of, of the young monk who goes up to the great master and says, Master, I have been longing for this deep, intimate relationship with my, with my God, and as yet I haven't found it. And he said, I want you to help me. And the master says, well, okay, come on down to the water's edge with me. And he does. So he says, let's wade in a bit, and they go in. Then he grabs the young monk's head, and he sticks his head under the water until he's almost drowned. And then when... The young monk comes up, he says, what's on your mind? What are you thinking? Breath. I want to breathe. I want to breathe. I want to breathe. He says, when you're longing for God is as intense as you're longing for breath, then, then you will have found what you are looking for. You see, there has to be an intensity to it. There has to be a fire under it. There has to be a deep, deep, passionate desire for this to be. That's the first part. But the second part is an open receptivity to knowing that this is meant to be. An openness to it. Making the way straight for this to happen. To allow that inlet of divine grace. And then to let it out again. It's the inlet and the outlet thing back. The innie outie again, as we call it in science of mind. It flows in, it flows out. We're just conduits. That's all we are. We're the vessels. And the vessels are open at the top and the bottom. You see, that's the beauty of grace. 
And again, I mean, where is your energy when it comes to your relationship with life? And that's all of life, because if you don't find this divine aspect and presence of spirit right here in yourself first, and it has to be first, it's not to be found anywhere. You will not find it anywhere. If you can't find it in your own mind, your own heart, your own body, in your own soul, it will not be found. And here's the wonder of it. When you find it here, automatically, you will find it out there, everywhere, in everything, and in everyone. And you will be going around in a state of knowing the God I am in every living thing, and everything lives. And that's the grace of it. That's the beauty of it. But what is it about ourselves we're not trusting? Why is it that we don't care enough about ourselves to give ourselves this opportunity? What is it about ourselves that we are resisting? That we are resisting the true essence of our being. That we are resisting that we could be the truth. That we could be this amazing vortex of energy, this point of power through which the infinite expresses itself if we allow it magnificently. What is that resistance within us? Why would we rather listen to something outside of ourselves, someone outside of ourselves, something outside of ourselves, rather than to go within, to journey within? It's the only journey worth the taking, is the journey within, to discover the awe and the incredible, unspeakable, ineffable, experience that flows out of that. If you can explain it and describe it, you're not getting it. What I'm talking about cannot be explained and cannot be described. It's like our teaching. People say it's difficult to explain our teaching. And I respond to that. It's not to be explained. It's to be defined by the way you live your life and the way I live mine. And then it's easy. And then it's easy. And I like that other story. You see, where are we in our life's journey with regard to getting and giving? Where are we with regard to collecting and gathering? Where are we with regard to releasing and letting go? Where are we within all of that? Because we live in the dual world of the material, and we live in the world also of the subtle. Now, the material world is everything we can see, everything in form, and the subtle world is, is, the, is the invisible world, the world wherein you and I are at our absolute, amazing, pure state of being. It's the eternality of us. The interior life is the life that goes on and on. Everything in the world changes. That's why we were invited not to get attached to anything that changes. Do not get attached to anything that changes and everything changes. You see, that's the conundrum. That's where we are. I mean, what, what would it be? How do we describe what the ones of old described in, in a language that is understandable? I don't know. What would the Psalms be like today? Yo, God, yo, God, yo, God. I'm in a funk. I'm really sunk. I'm deep in the trolls of illusion. You know, whatever way you want to describe how we would describe our state today. But we've got to let it out. We've got to describe it. We've got to say how it is. We've got to be real about it. And I am not diminishing anybody's pain, sorrow, sadness, suffering, not at all. What I'm saying is there's a way for us all to handle that. There's a place to put all that. There's a, there's, there's a way through all of that and the coming through of it being the better for it and knowing that there's good in everything because of omnipresence. You see, omnipresence is omnipresence. You can't be a little bit pregnant, you know what I mean? You're pregnant or you're not pregnant. You're either omnipresent or you're not omnipresent. That means everywhere present. And that means yes, in you and me too and in him and her over there in the neighbor next door as well. And so your calling and my calling is simply just to wake up in the splendor, in the awareness, in the glory of who and what we all are. Now, we have our work cut out for us at the moment. There is a time when we have to roll up our spiritual sleeves and really get down and scrub those spiritual floors. And this is the time. And you and I cannot waste a moment on awfulizing and terribleizing 
and, and uh, sharing opinions that may or may not be true are taking seriously opinions that may or may not be true. You and I have to be what we are right here and right now. We are part of what Dr. Ken was reminding us on Friday night of the thousand people that Ernest Holmes said, give me that thousand people who know the principles of science of mind, who imbibe the principles of science of mind, who live for the principles of science of mind, and I will give you a new world, a new world. And it's Watson's hundred monkey. It only takes that quantum number for things to change on this planet, and the quantum number might be much smaller than you and I could ever imagine. So remember, I'm considering all of us as that, the numbers in the quantum number as uh, the ones in the thousand. All of us. And that's why you and I are so significantly called, so importantly called right now to be all that we can be and to get through the nonsense and the illusion of what we are not. We will not focus on what we are not, we will focus on what we are. And in the focusing upon it, we won't ignore what we think we are not, but in the focusing upon who we are in truth, we will get into the experience and the expression of that reality, that truth. And again, where is your investment in all of this? Are you really vested in your spiritual unfoldment? Are you really and truly wanting to be truth students that are actually doing and being what needs to be done and who you need to be in order to get the benefit of that? and to have this fearlessness as you go about life, to have that courageousness, not to be brought down by every negative thing that you will see or hear, but to know there's more to it than this, there's more to it than this. And as you're watching the news, you'll say, that's not my truth, that's not my truth, my truth is more than that. And we will be like the monk who was traveling through the forest and he was about to have his lunch. He came to a clearing, he sat down, and uh, as he was having his lunch, a thief was watching him carefully and saw a beautiful shining object in the bag that the monk had, and it was this gorgeous diamond. And so when the monk was finished, he was on his way, and when he'd gone a ways, the thief jumped out, and he um, wanted to frighten the monk, and the monk says, well, what do you want? And he said, I want the diamond that's in your bag. And he says, well, why would you want that? I want the diamond that's in your Okay, here it is, have it. And off the monk went. And so the fellow was running off, and he got away a bit, and he looked around to see if he was being followed by the monk. And he was astounded and shocked and appalled at what he saw. The monk was sitting down cross-legged with this beautiful beatific face and this wonderful blissful composure, and he was just there with this beautiful, serene smile on his face. And then something happened in that thief, and he ran back. And he shook the monk, and he opened his eyes, and he said, yes, what can I do for you? He said, here, I want you to take the diamond back, take the diamond back, take the diamond back. Teach me how you were able to let go of it so easily, and how you can sit there in such peace. Teach me, teach me. Now, are we like that? Are we wanting to be taught? Are we wanting to really get on the inside of who we are and what we are and whose we are? Because if we are, we've got to rise up. There's got to be energy and action under our desire and our thinking and our longing and our wanting. We've got to rise up and not in temper, we to rise up in love. We have to rise up, not in fear, but to rise up in fearlessness. We've got to rise up, not in protest, but in peace. That's what we have to do, rise up. Get up off our spiritual dairy airs and be it for God's sake, and so it is. <laughs> You're the ones, you're the ones. You're standing, doctor, good doctor. Would you please come forward? Do we have a hand mic? 
I would love our Dr. Ken is with us today, Do Dr. Ken Gordon. He is our spiritual leader. He is a man who is deeply committed to an intimate relationship with his source. I know this because he's a good friend of mine. And he has a sweet soul, but he's strong and potent and powerful in his role as this spiritual leader too. And he's going to share a few words with us. It's my delight to welcome you. I, I don't even know where to go. <laughs> Have you got any idea of the depth of that conversation or that talk that she just did? So it's one of the most horrific things being a, a senior minister and having a center of my own and traveling around. I rarely get to take a Sunday off and come and hear someone speak. And last time I was here, I snuck in and sat at the back and I haven't heard the end of it since. So, <laughs> but, but, but I have to tell you, as we come here as community to be fed, and what an incredible community you have here. Uh, what, what a marvelous community that this is. That you have a place to come uh, to be able to reside in the truth. And I was so uh, happy to be uh, invited to speak uh, on Friday night for the 70th anniversary. 70 years of hearing truth in this room. 70 years of hearing it spoken and having it placed out there uh, for you to pick it up if you choose. And, and I can't support Dr. Moira enough when she talks about this. It's important for us to pick it up. Now's the time, without a question. Um, because I travel so much and I, I get to meet so many people and spend such a great deal of time with people, well, what I've discovered is that there is a crisis fatigue that is happening right now. And so what I'm attempting to do is to ensure people that that fatigue is a passing place for us to go and that we have to rise above it and step out of it. We have to rise up that we cannot allow that to keep us quiet and keep us small in what's happening in the world around us and what's going on. In order to meet our vision, what we have to do is we have to embrace that life that Dr. Moyer was just talking about. And, and what's occurring and what's going on is nothing more than an effect. It's, it's like my, my wife is fond of saying is that uh, life is like a rock grinder. We're all thrown in there and we bump against each other until we grow smooth. And that's precisely what is happening right now. What is occurring in our world right now is the demonstration and the manifestation of our treatments. When we treat for a world that works for everyone, what we're treating for is we're treating for everything that is necessary and required in order to create the garden, the bed, for this to grow and this to become reality. William Meter said in 2014 uh, that when the light shines brighter, the shadow grows. And so what we're witnessing in the world around us is this growing shadow. And there has never been a time when it's been more important to be involved in the truth so that what we can do is we can see through the shadow and bring light to it. Because once we bring light to it, it dissipates and disappears. And the magnificence of that is exactly as Dr. Moyer was talking about. It is a requirement and it is a pull upon us to become intimate with our own selves and our own being. We, we really don't have a challenge with intimacy. We have a challenge with self-recognition. We have a challenge of knowing who we are. And all of the shades and all of the filters that we see in our society are shades and filters that are placed there to protect what we think we need to protect because we're not prepared to surrender what we need to surrender in order to become what we were born to be. And, and that awakening is, 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 is a spark within us. And it is centers such as this that teach that. And, and it just doesn't have to have the name of religious science or centers for spiritual living on it. Every time people come together and hear the truth, the resonant truth, what happens is there's something that awakens within them. Did you not resonate with something that Dr. Moira said? Wasn't there something inside of you that cried out and said, oh my God, that's it, that's the answer, that, that's where it's at? That's because that's real, capital R, real. 
as opposed to small r real, which is what we see being foisted and pushed in the world around us in reaction to what is occurring and what is happening. And, and, and we don't limit it on just the individual societal humanity. It, it, it happens in the world around us. It happens in our weather, it happens in our planet, it happens in the universe. It is called forth to happen because we are that center. This is the life that is whole that we're talking about. And when we finally rise to embrace it, what will occur is we will end up with a world that works for everyone because we all fit into the mosaic of life and perfection. And when we're willing to surrender ourselves to be that which we were born to be, what occurs is that we fit together, like two gears coming together and two cogs working in perfection, or like a hand in a glove. Suddenly what we do is we awaken <clears throat> to the reality and everything is transformed around us. Everything changes. So for 70 years this message has been spoken here. Thousands upon thousands of people. Some of the greatest teachers in the movement have stood on this stage or any stage that it happened to be in because I will tell you something is that this is an iconic church in our movement and being an iconic church in our movement it is the teaching church for many, many ministers that go out from here and do other things. But it is not about the form. It's not about the building. I will tell you where the iconic part comes from. You are the iconic part. You, the people in the audience and the people who stand here, the people who come together. And in this day and age where it is so easy to get lost in the, in the uh, aloneness of classes online, of things that happen and participate there, and they're all wonderful things, the one thing that we all crave is spiritual community to be able to come together, to be able to test and practice our intimacy skills with other human beings, and to be able to actually step up. Because what we're doing when we work with each other is what we are doing is we are working with ourselves and for ourselves and on ourselves. And that is what the most important thing in this movement is. It's the most important thing in life, period. So I celebrate with you your 70 years of, of magnificent history. I celebrate with you uh, the magnificence of the teaching that you're part of, that, that you stepped into this teaching of truth. I celebrate with you the, the firecracker that you have as a minister um, who, who is absolutely magnificent and always moves me to my knees. And is appropriately the student of Frank and Anita Richelieu, who also were iconic and, and marvelous teachers. And like I said on Friday night, and then the one before that was Earl Barnum, who was my teacher's teacher. My teacher was Tom Costa. So uh, you get a picture there of the lineage that we're talking about here, this lineage of the awakening of truth. And, and, and I'll share this teaching. This teaching was the founding of what we call now the self-help movement. Have you noticed that? that? That if you actually go back far enough, and this is our 100th year from the time when Dr. Holmes actually stood up and uh, began to speak in public. Um, or next year is rather, 2018. And, and so 100 years of this message from Dr. Holmes rippling out around the world and the transformation that it shows in everything we do. When I graduated from ministerial school and moved back to Kelowna, British Columbia, my hometown, to start the church that my wife and I founded, the first class I ever gave was in a grade three classroom. And I can remember coming back, I came out of Palm Desert and went home and I thought, oh God, I know something. I've got, <laughs> I've got something to share with everybody. I really, I've always been arrogant. And, and I just, I've got this, I've got something to deliver, I've got something to deliver. And I went and I hired this classroom to do my first ever science of mind class. And eight people showed up for the class. And so I, I walked in to teach this class and they were all sitting in those little grade three bent <laughs> seats uh, and, and waiting. And I walked in and my entire lesson, I noticed along the, the balance of the, 
of the classroom, where all these affirmations and quotes that have been written there for the grade three kids to learn, and what they were is they were the reflection of every single thing that I'd learned in six years. <laughs> And, and so, and so uh, that was 25 years ago, and what I've had to do for 25 years is run like hell to stay in front of those grade three kids. <laughs> I had to study and practice, I had to apply, I had to put it into activity, I had to put it into action. Why? Because it's always growing, it's always expanding, and this teaching has transformed the world. And we are moving now to a, a greater and a bigger place than we've ever been before. You know, you know, Dr. Holmes would begin his radio talk show and he would say, there is a power in the universe that is greater than I am and I can use it, or greater than you are and you can use it. And there is something that's happening in our teaching right now and we can bless the depth of people like Dr. Moira, who helped bring it to the forefront, who spoke about it here. And this transformation that's taking place is very subtle, but it's happening. And that happening is there's a power in the universe that is greater than I am, and it can use me. And when we surrender to that, when we allow that to happen, it picks us up and takes us where we need to go. And that is the lesson that the shadow is teaching us in the world right now. It is teaching us to surrender to that higher greatness. And when we achieve that, what we will do is achieve a world that works for everyone. I am blessed to be here. Uh, you are my blessing, and you are blessed to be here. And so it is. Thank you, sir.